let's see what we have going on. We have uh, I probably our next promotion is going to be made in um, just going through the uh, usual QA soak cycle. Um, we've had a pending merge for the performance floater work for a while where we're trying to uh, reconcile uh, Bex implementation with uh, uh, with the one that we had done originally and that I think is pretty close that's been submitted for QA now um, it's had had uh, UX feedback and everything so um, hopefully that will be getting into the queue fairly soon I think that'll be coming out as a project viewer update uh, as the next step um, so maybe next week or something like that. Uh, let's see, what else is going on? Uh, we have... You know, Signal had mentioned uh, some to uh, topic related to auto-build. I'm not seeing him yet, though. Catch him if he, uh, if he comes by later. Um, let's see, we're continuing a pace on materials and PBR. Lots of spiffy graphics in the pipeline. Um, Dave, do you want to give a kind of capsule summary of what's going on there? Sure. Uh, the first snippets of LSL functionality are out there on the uh, the test regions, and uh, that's thanks to Cosmic. Um, and there are some more changes coming in the pipe um, with an override system. Uh, you might start to see uh, some interesting things in how uh, that data is getting shipped. Um, I had a meeting about that today, and it's looking like the way that we're going to uh, do the override system is you'll be able to specify a JSON blob per texture entry. Um, that would be GLTF compliant JSON. Um, Please don't get ahead of us on which fields are supported. <laughs> so that that blob will will be interrogated somewhere to uh, make sure that it doesn't have fields that aren't ready for prime time uh, and the official viewer. Um, how we extend that to support other parts of the spec that that hopefully will be an ongoing conversation with with everybody here and. For the content creators. Um, but yeah, hopefully that'll that'll lay the groundwork for rapidly expanding uh, the kind of features that we can support on the data back end and on the render front end. Uh, that's all about all that's going on there. Just to mind. It's been a lot of overhaul on the uh on the shaders, I think. So you've been seeing a lot of work with uh, trying to do kind of regression checking and making sure that things yes. look uh, look right oh. and all of that. One of the big changes, I can't remember if that's been announced here or not, is we're going to uh, linear space um, alpha blending. Um, it's important to keep fidelity with uh, reflection probes and other things that um, we stay in linear space as much as possible, uh, and the GLTF spec has some very choice things to say about what color spaces lighting has to be applied in. So, with alpha not being in linear space, just the number of conversions that stack up gets to be untenable. Um, I know some third-party viewers are already doing that. I don't know how many, um, but that'll become something that's just standard. All right, sounds good. Uh, let's see, I see signals here now. Signal, you had a topic related to auto build, I believe. Yeah, a quick one. Here's. And um, if you've read the open source mailing list, as has already been linked in chat, there was a there have been some releases to auto build coming out, um, and notably, we've been publishing these to PyPy for the first time in two years, which means you can just do pip install auto build to get the Python 3 version. 
But generally, I wanted to throw out um, just, you know, by the way, the news that we have some new features um, in auto build, um, such as using being able to pull packages from private GitHub releases or GitLab generic package sources. And um, in addition to that, you know, I think it would be awesome if anyone that has a forked version of auto build, uh, you know, could figure out what they need to be able to use the upstream version of auto build. So this is really simple to use and it has all the features that all the all your developers need for your viewers. Um, and you can reach out to me about that in Discord or in Second Life um, to see if it would make sense to have a pull request uh, or if you'd, if you'd want to contribute uh, any delta between upstream and your fork. And that was kind of it. I wanted to throw it out there and just generally ask if people have any uh, features that they need for auto build that are missing. So you're using Windows Subsystem for Linux instead of Sigwin, Kitty? Yeah, I've also found that uh, min uh, GW is basically as compatible uh, with Sigwin as, or basically it just works in place of Sigwin. And so you could use uh, the git bash that's included when you install bash in Windows. How much did you have to change to get WSL to work? Um, I'll go ahead and answer Felix's question. Um, okay, Kitty doesn't sound too bad. Um, devil's always in the details. I'm be interested in know the compatibility with, you know, our third party libraries. Um, but I think that having WSL support is something that even our internal developers have really wanted. Felix, um, in terms of the support for WWW authentication, that is actually really closely related to the credentials um, system that was put in place to support GitHub and GitLab. And that's just setting an HTTP bearer token. And so if that could, you know, similarly set other HTTP headers according to some arbitrary scheme that you give it, um, we could come up with a new scheme uh, to do basic auth or something. It needs to be provider specific so that you can have secrets specific to the host that the artifact is stored on. But okay. Thank you. Um, do you have any more comments about that? You know, uh, ping me. Thank you. All right, anything else, Ryder? Anything new and different on the simulator side? Uh, no, no, nothing today. One back-end thing that we talk about sometimes at this meeting is uh, MFA. There's um, still one more login change in the works for that um, that's gotten... Uh, kind of stacked up behind some other work. I um, think it's largely done. It's more just needing to be deployed. So hopefully that can come out in the not too distant future. Um, one one reason that's of interest is it's been a blocker for uh, MFA enforcement, basically. Uh, you know, what, what you really want is if people have opted into MFA, then they have to use an MFA supported viewer as opposed to just being able to switch from one viewer to another to, to get around that. Um, and uh, so then once you've got this last login change done, we can start talking about the time frame for that stuff. Um, let's see, another topic that I don't remember if we've talked about here or not, um, but uh, We've been trying to trying to work towards standardizing our use of um, 
some of the inventory capabilities a bit more. We've had like a we've had a V2 and a V3 floating around for quite a while. Um, the V2 is going to be getting phased out, and uh, you know at some point we'll probably go away. Um, but you know before we get to that point, we'll be uh, transitioning our own viewer over so that it's only using V3. Um, as we've mentioned, there's a reasonable prospect that we'll be, you know, adding new fields to inventory at some point. When we do that, it's pretty likely that those fields would only be accessible through the, uh, you know, the latest version of the uh, of the AIS, the the V3. So uh, uh, again, that would be a reason that people would want to uh, transition over when we get to that stage. But uh, we'll keep you posted on that one. Let's see. Uh, Mojo, anything you want to uh, talk about this week? I am spectating for the moment. Um, but nothing new for me. All right, sounds good. I guess that's uh, that's about it for plan topics. Uh, anybody have uh, other questions or things they want to kick around? Uh, Kitty, you asked about the URL profile field. Um, where was that before and is it now? I'm I'm not familiar with that one, so I'm not sure what the change is. Okay, so this is a field that you can set in through web profiles, but that there isn't any way to get to through the legacy profiles viewer. Is that right? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one, but I will try to dig up an answer on it. Yep, failing gear is always a good idea.
Uh, we're only question about uh, server fix. Right? Are you still with us? You know about that one? Can hear? Yep. Uh, the ten, the ten group limit is coming out. Um, I didn't know about the res date being a day off. I'm actually checking my res date. You're right. It's a day off. Yeah, pass pass me the 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 Jira. Um, I'm not sure that's a simu. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to fix that in the simulator. That's probably a different system, but we can look in. But as long as it's on my radar. It's storing a timestamp so that the uh, time zone can throw it off or something. People cool. Uh, it's it's probably a ser it's probably a server issue, but but there are there are lots of servers. Yeah, mine should be this. Mine should be the uh, the set uh, March second. So. Oh, really? Because I show the first. Yeah, I've got. I, I'm showing. I'm showing. Yeah, so I'm showing the first here. That is my guess, Kitty. Yeah, I we we pretty much just pass that information straight through on uh, in the in the cap. So, question is, where does it where is it changing? Sounds like we need to Jira. She she passed one. 
Ah, okay. Scrolling too fast for me. Right. Uh, hopefully, 10 groups will be fixed on next week's RC. All right, open for other topics. Anything? Any new uh, viewer releases coming out soon? That's a good question. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the same as if uh, you made a third-party viewer. Uh, viewer, do you know the particulars? Uh, so the question is just, is it okay to, to have pointers to the existing source code for, for how we create primitives? Or, or are we talking about like adding adding code to Blender, it's like a you know an additional plugin or whatever? I'm not sure if you're talking about referencing the code, referencing our code, or referencing the the Blender thing, or what? Oh, uh, no, it shouldn't be. I mean, you know, it's it's open source. Use use it how you want. Um, just uh, just uh, you know, give give appropriate reference to it. Yeah, if you want to be super safe, um, then you can treat it like uh, like you pulled the source directly. Um, and do the LGPL thing. Yeah, that's going to be the safest option without getting something in writing 
through a non-standard channel. Um, and I don't mean to, to speak on, on what like Lenin Lab is likely to do. Um, just talking about open source stuff in general. Uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, it gets into a gray area. Um, you can look at cases where um, people have gotten into fights over APIs and looking at headers. Um, I'm not saying Linden Lab is likely to do that, but just in general. If something is LGPL and you're making a derived work of it, it it's good to do the sublicense thing. And speaking of people getting into fights over things. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, VS 2022, Veer? Um, yes, we are moving the viewer to VS 2022. Um, Callum has been spearheading that, and he's been out this week. Um, but we have licenses at this point. So what I expect is that, uh, you know, in the not-too-distant future, there will be a... Um, there will be a dirt viewer that uh, is designed to be built with VS2022. Um, when we're actually going to update all the third-party libraries, it's going to be a little ways down the road. That's going to be done as part of the migration to GitHub project. Um, since we've already got that in the works, we didn't want to do two complete sets of library rebuilds in a you know within a month or two of each other. So that's just way too many library re rebuilds. Um, so at some point, uh, you know, once we've got the Dirt Viewer for VS2022, that stuff will get migrated into uh, an official release viewer and people will need to start using 2022 at that point. Five, yeah, I think 568 is the one that Callum's been working on. So, yeah, that'll be working its way into the pipeline. At this point, it's all just internal. There's no uh, there's no public-facing releases, but uh, we'll, you know, once that's once that's all working, we'll probably do a project viewer, and people can you know check it out in advance of when it actually goes live. Yep. Uh, I know auto build as it is will generate Visual Studio 2019 projects that will work against the uh, 2017, I want to say, compiled libraries.
Visual Studio has gotten a lot, uh, a lot more compatible between releases in recent years in the sense that one, you can have multiple versions installed at the same time and stuff will still continue to work and uh, also that you can often just link previously built libraries against current uh, current executables and that will also behave itself. Yep. Uh, granted, a lot of that goes out the window when you try to build with Clang, but baby steps. Yeah, we're not we're not doing anything about Clang with the 2022 update. One thing we've been doing a little bit of digging into is, uh, you know, which C++ compatibility settings it's safe to use. Um, I th the last the last I heard, everything was building okay with 20 C++ 17 flag, but uh, we were running into some issues with the 20 flag. So I'm not sure exactly how far that's going to wind up getting advanced for this release. Um, there are ways around the name and address side, side of uh, the code signing thing, but there has to be a name and a address. Uh, do you mean there's a way of preventing it from being published, or are you saying that the name and address you give isn't real? Because <laughs> that doesn't sound no, quite right. No, no. Uh, start an LLC, have a P.O. box. Um, but then they can look you up in company's house, can't they? Because I thought about that. Yes. Um... I'm trying to remember. I... There might have been something that you can do with a trust. But yeah, there's no technical way. <laughs> it's all legal fictions. Yeah, I was looking at this recently with with third party viewers. Uh, is 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 there anyone who's currently doing uh, uh, code signing on their on their executables? Firestorm does for Mac, yeah. So, Kitty, does that mean that you had to had to put up, uh, you know, Firestorm had to put up some kind of a link to, uh, you know, personal info and all of that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of a tricky one. Um, you know, if you if you're a big company, then uh, you know you've got your corporate representative, and it's not a big deal. But um, that is kind of a uh, kind of an unpleasant barrier if you're you know just working as a, one or two individuals. I think there's a couple of different types of checks. There's, there's, um, you know, it, like like uh, antivirus or Windows Defender, or whoever is checking for, you know, is this a familiar executable, and the warnings related to that may go away as it sees the executable more often. Um, I'm not so sure about the warning about, you know, unknown publisher though.
it's not quite yeah, so we, bad it was in a itself, long time for us it? to get Max sorted out. That was a that was a big pain. I was talking about the Windows Defender one where it says Windows has protected you. That's the one that goes away after so many warnings, but the yellow one never right, goes away. Right. But the, I think the warning about, you know, do you want to install this program from an unknown publisher specifically requires signing to get around. Yeah, and meanwhile, Putty got Trojaned. So, yeah. Well, there's about 20 minutes left, and it looks like the topics have dried up. Who wants to talk about land impact limits? LOD factor clamping. Uh, I'll provide some context. Um, I talked about this at the Content Creators User Group earlier this week, um, but uh, the way things are going right now, if a new user comes in and they've got LOD settings that allow them to draw the world at a reasonable frame rate on a typical uh, laptop that we see coming in, um, the world looks broken, uh, and a lot of that is coming from uh, content that uh, is specifically set up to only uh, look correct on uh, LOD factors that are beyond what the official viewer supports. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of y'all are already familiar with this problem. Uh, the main viewer doesn't do any clamping at all. You can go into your debug settings and set it to whatever you want. Um, and some third-party viewers do clamp it. Oh, we clamp it for? You're kidding.
Yeah, I'm checking right now. Uh, I thought we were at least clamping at four on the slider. I'm not sure if it's enforced. Clamp at two on the slider. Mm. No, I just set it to eight. Um, unless it's happening in the code somewhere I didn't find. And it's just ignoring that eight. Uh, at any Where rate, did you set it? In the slider or in the debug settings? In the debug settings. Well, I'm going to need to have to verify that. Um, at any rate, uh, it, it's an ongoing discussion. I'm trying to figure out how to like how to correct for that because right now. Like, uh, officially nothing above 2 is really supported, because that's what the, uh, the UI does, um, and the main viewer, uh, and people have made a lot of content where if you set it, if you set the LED factor to anything other than something higher than what's supported, and you have a draw distance that's like a mid-range range draw distance, uh, there's just all these broken objects everywhere. So, the open question is, what do we do about that? Um, so, clamping at four was one thing that was discussed, and if we're already doing that, then yay. Uh, do we need to dial that back more? Do we need to um, say that three is the official supported maximum and make sure that all the third-party viewers don't allow anything higher than three? What do we do? Discuss. Right. Uh, one of the uh, ideas that Beck keeps uh, pushing for, which is a good idea that we should do, is um, right now the LED factors, it, it just looks at the, uh, the number of degrees on screen that a uh, bounding sphere of an object takes up. Um, Beck's suggestion is to make that scale with screen resolution, so higher resolutions effectively get an implicit LED factor multiplier. which would effectively change what the real maximum is for higher resolutions. I'm sure that most of the people who are discussing this already know the background, but I'm, I'm going to go over a little bit here just in case anybody's kind of trying to follow along for the first time. Um, you know, we have we have a, a mechanism that allows different LEDs to be created for an object when it's uploaded. And the intent is that, uh, you know, the, the coarser LEDs are an approximation of the same object with a smaller number of triangles, uh, meaning that if you're viewing it from farther away, it's going to look pretty much the same because you can't see that much detail from farther away uh, anyway. And for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, including just trying to make, uh, just trying to do less work, people don't necessarily create uh, the, the coarser LODs and they'll just drop in one or two triangles instead, which means that as soon as you zoom out far enough that that LOD becomes active, your object is going to look like garbage. So the, you know, the, the, 
render volume LOD factor, which we're talking about the, the setting for here, is basically a control for how far away you can zoom before the coarser LODs start to become visible. So it's it's not really about uh, you know making the object look right you know with its own content. It's about kind of basically trying to force the radius at which that happens far enough away that nobody's going to notice that they're when the object turns into garbage. Which also means that um, at any closer distance, you're using vastly more triangles than you actually need to render the object. You're just forcing people to always or almost always use their, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of triangles to represent uh, an object, even if it's, uh, you know, pretty much just a speck on the screen. Um, and that's horribly inefficient, which is why uh, we're, we're uh, you know, pushing against it in the first place. Gives you, a, gives you a crummy frame rate, especially on lower end machines. But I mean, no machine can tolerate just infinite amounts of content per per uh, frame. Right, and and of course the uh, the motivation for people doing this is that they get a lower land impact. Um, so if um, people can sell an object has a lower land impact, they're likely to sell more of it because people will search for things that have a lower land impact and they can game the LED system by putting broken triangles and the medium LED and then telling their customers that oh, they just need to go into the debug settings and up their um, uh, LED factor. And if the official viewer won't let them do it, then go download some other viewer. I mean, it's not just about land impact, though, because... Uh... You know, LODs are also a factor for, uh, you know, avatars and, and attachments on avatars. You know, basically all the mesh content that goes on a typical avatar today. Avatars don't even get charged at a land impact, but they're, uh, 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 but they're still uh, frequently made with, uh, with horrible LODs, so you can't, uh, you can't zoom out very far away and, and have them look right. Right, and we've already made a change with the performance viewer that got around um, people doing ridiculous scale on rigged meshes in order to circumvent the LOD system. Um, that So if you're not seeing that take effect, then please report a bug. Because I'd be interested to know what content is getting around it still. Yeah, I understand the reactions have been, what's the word, vitriolic uh, to, uh, as far as the uh, third-party viewers are, are, are concerned with, uh, when they introduce I, these limits. I was just going to say, I seem to remember, a, a, I was about to say Firestorm, but a, uh, a great wailing several years ago uh, when we... It, when we put in that clamp at four. Uh, Chaser, can you talk a little bit more about the download cost skyrocketing? Um, I mean, you know, even even a proper LOD is is still a small fraction of the cost of the original full resolution mesh. So, uh, and and you're basically always going to be downloading those. So, I mean, is the is the additional overhead really significant if you you kind of sum it up. I mean, I can speak to how the math works out, but or yeah, or are you talking but... about cost in terms of like how long it takes to download? Or are you talking about cost in terms of like how we how we price the uh, kind of formula that that applies to objects in world? 
Uh, but right. the people so, being punished in terms of the the costs uh, for LODs is is definitely a, a factor, and we we understand the concern there. And 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 the, the the complaint about the land impact when you make proper LODs versus someone who doesn't make proper LODs. Um, I understand the incentive, but it's it's a what about argument. It's what about this guy who did something terrible? Now I'm should now I should be allowed to do something terrible. Um, the the way the math works out on the land impact, uh, it's trying to get a consistent uh, triangle ceiling, like like what's the most number of triangles that a viewer will have to display if all the content on a region is evenly distributed um, at roughly the same height, uh, and you've got to draw a distance of 256 meters. Um, the math works out. Uh, it, it, it does that. Um, when it's penalizing you for the LEDs you've provided, that's because if you took that item at that size and put it all over a region, you would blow the budget. Uh, so yes, it is true that by dropping the lower LOD, particularly on a smaller object, uh, you see a, like an exponential drop and land impact if your lower LOD is one triangle versus a hundred. Um, but that's because if you've got 15,000 copies of that 100 triangle object, that's 100 triangles no matter where you look at it from, um, you've just hit, uh, doing math in my head and I'm going to carry the zero around, but I'm pretty sure that's on what, one and a half million triangles. Yeah. Right, so what we're really talking about is, is really what we're dancing around here is in the name of the shared user experience and is it appropriate for us to say thou shalt not touch the LOD calculation um, and the maximum LOD factor is some number. Yeah, and what uh, Felix says about how we don't discount items um, when there are multiple instances of that item. Um, that That's true. We only download it once. Uh, the render cost is still there. So it is kind of disingenuous to claim that there's a streaming cost associated with 10 copies of the same thing. Um, but I'm not sure it's a good idea to change that because there are often multiple copies of it, uh, say in the, in the physics representation or in viewer memory. Um, 
right now that it is picked up by the streaming costs somewhat. And the reason it's you'll end up with multiple copies and in, in a physics rep um, is because you'll you'll end up with the static scene baked down to the same coordinate frame because you get faster collision detection that way. And the the viewer does a similar thing to cut down on the matrix ops. Okay. Uh, just reading some of the comments in. Uh in chat here it, it sounds like there's a general consensus that we do in fact need to have a cap but it's a uh, kind of a collective action problem and to some extent it's actually helpful if we're willing to be the bad guys on that yep and the other side of the coin is uh oh, let me speak to render dynamic led false um so render dynamic LED false isn't supported. It's debug setting. Uh, that one, that one's tricky because that one doesn't actually turn off LOD. That uh, that picks an LOD and sticks to it. Um, so it picks an LOD based on the size of the object. It just takes the the camera position out of the equation. Uh, for some scenes that actually makes the frame rate go up um, and get smoother. Uh, so, yeah, that one, that one they're probably just going to go ahead and let that one lie. <laughs> I think that one we're, we're probably more likely to promote to a uh, advanced preference than uh, to uh, disallow. But it'll probably just be in a gray area for a little bit. Yes, you would. Um, and that might be the kind of thing where I mean, at the end of the day, we we have to set up a system where people can create things, and we don't have to have uh, gatekeepers, but the world still looks and runs good. Um, so we don't want to have a system where you have to like submit your mesh for review, and a human has to look at it before you can sell it to people. That's that's not fun. Um, and we also have to deal with the fact that we've got all this content out there already that looks like it does um, and at the end of the day if the content creators can't adhere to some building principles that uh, enable the world to scale well uh, by providing their own LODs, then we'd have to look at providing a system that replaces the artist provided LODs with ones that are machine generated. Um, and some of that work is going to have to happen anyway just because of the avatar problem and um, trying to get uh, Second Life content to run on you know, these devices that people have in their pockets that don't even have keyboards. We're uh, uh, at time here, so... Oh yeah, we are. Pretty sure there's, I'm pretty sure there's more to say, but we may have to say it another time. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit. Um, yeah, all right. Well, thanks for coming by, everybody.
Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Horley, did you have a last uh, last thing? Thanks for the heads up there. Um, probably definitely send that one to, to log. Yeah. Uh, you know what comes next? Can we get a Jira for that? <laughs> Be happy to have somebody take a look. Yeah, Felix was saying to, to show poly counts on the marketplace. Um, that's not a bad idea. Um, but for, for the, like, like, like the principal problem is somebody comes into second life, um, and they don't care enough about second life yet to work for it. And they see stuff looks broken and it runs bad and then they leave. Um, like. That's the big problem, uh, and the way the content on the ground is, if we up the LOD factor to a point where uh, it doesn't look broken, then it runs worse, and if we drop the LOD factor to a point where it runs okay, it looks broken. So. Yeah, there are all these great ideas about, okay, how can we expose the thing that's behaving badly, etc. But that's, those those are too late buttons. It's like waiting for the uh, oil pressure light to come on before you change your oil. Right, and, and that that's the other side of the experiment is if we actually do clamp this thing and we do say hey third-party viewers aren't allowed to go beyond a certain limit um, are people actually going to fix their stuff or are they gonna get mad and leave or are they gonna come up with some other way to work around it Yeah, I, I have a sculpt turtle and he's awesome. And to be clear, we're open to a range of different approaches and it's likely that multiple things are gonna get done eventually. Um, you know, we were raising the LED factor thing first because it's it's about the easiest not necessarily politically but it's you know technically it's about the easiest change we can make um, you know things like giving marketplace more information about uh, objects is uh, is much harder there's a, there's a lot of problems you have to solve to be able to to do that sort of thing even though it would be a big advantage uh, you know if, if and when we can Okay, well, it sounds like four is a given. Um,
there will have to be some internal discussions about how we go about enforcing that. if we do it all um, but this feedback has been helpful thank you I'm going to get back to the code. See you all next time.